Well, I am here with uh, Sylvie Poyo, who is mm -hmm. the uh, general manager, is that the right term? Mm -hmm. sure. right. At Domaine de la Vougere. Uh, and I'm going to start with a little brief recap of how I got involved with this domain, um, because it only has existed since 1999. The backstory is that uh, Monsieur Jean Claude Boisset uh, started out as uh, a very young entrepreneur interested in vineyards, bought his first vineyards, uh, the Chevrolet Chambertin des Eversel, that we're going to taste. And over the years, he was sufficiently successful when other people were failing, impossible to imagine any wine company in Burgundy failing at the moment, but it wasn't always that way. And there are a lot of quite long established, uh, small, old fashioned negotiant houses that hadn't modernized and were failing. So he would buy them up regularly because he was interested in the model of selling wine through having very effective distribution systems. Whereas most people in Burgundy are farmers who grow the grapes and make the wine and just hope they can find a market somewhere. So he got the distribution right and he bought all these different companies. Um, Ponel would be one, uh, and, but there are loads of them. And it, and it goes on today. So, so more recently, uh, Vincent Giraudin, for example. Um, and then someone pointed out uh, that it might make sense. All these companies tended to have a few vineyards. So why not create a domain out of the assembled vineyards rather than them getting lost in the, in the sort of more commercial blends of the various different labels? And uh, he put in charge initially uh, Pascal Marchand, who had just finished his stint working at the uh, Domaine du Comte d'Armand in Pommard, and uh, was looking for uh, a new challenge. And uh, uh, they established Domaine de la Rougere with quite a few vineyards, which they've added to since. So Pascal made those first wines from 1999, and I'd known him, well, since he first came to Burgundy pretty much in 1985. And I bought his wines that he'd made at Comte d'Armor. So I thought, let's continue with the new venture. Uh, Sylvie came on board just a uh, very few years later, 2002. And she's effectively been the general manager ever since. And there have been different winemakers. Uh, Pascal left in 2005 and started his own business in Rue Saint-Georges. And uh, straight away after that, they appointed a very bright young man called Pierre Vincent as winemaker. And he stayed through till 2016-17 uh, when he got pinched by Domaine Lefebvre. So we had to boycott Domaine Lefebvre for a couple of years uh, because of that. Hi, Kenneth. Um, so anyway, um, the wines changed a little bit when the wine maker changed, Pierre Vincent. Since Pierre left, Sylvie has led a team, slightly different people doing different jobs, making the white wines and red wines. Uh, but the quality has remained very high. So, Sylvie, bienvenue, welcome. Well, welcome. I'm very happy to, to see all you going to taste such a, a very nice appellation, especially one uh, about uh, Les Evocelles. I'm very happy to taste it again. It's, uh, there's a little story about uh, this vineyard. And uh, I'm here since uh, 20 years now. And uh, for the, the harvest uh, 22, it's not finished yet about the vinification because we still have two vats. So that's why I'm a little uh, tired today. But uh, anyway, so happy to be with you. Yeah, so I, I promise to, to keep sort of nudging Sylvia. She, <laughs> she falls asleep from exhaustion. We'll keep her awake. So uh, we've got three white wines to taste and I imagine they'll be served uh, to use one after the other. Uh, two are Grand Cru's and one sounds as though it's a Grand Cru because it's the Clos Blanc de Vougeot. But it's not white vineyards within the Clos de Vougeot, it's right next door. Um, and this is a vineyard which we believe was first plant, planted by the monks in 1110, so 900 plus years ago. And we believe it was planted in white and has been in white all the way through. And there is a difference in the soil. If you pick up a handful of soil from the Clos Blanc, and you pick up a handful of soil from Clos Rougeau just across the wall, they're really quite noticeably different. And when I first started, the first vintage we were selling in 1999, I was a bit skeptical about whether or not we could sell a lot of this wine uh, because it's a premier crew from Vougeau, already Vougeau is not that well known. 
uh, a white premier crew in the middle of the Côte de Nuit, not very well known. And the pricing was relatively expensive from the demand, which was otherwise practicing very reasonable prices. So they wanted me to take about 50 cases as proportionate with other things I was taking. And I said, well, look, I'll promise you 20 and we'll see how it goes. And Jean Charles Boisset, son of Jean Claude, came to our tasting in London and stood behind the bottle. And uh, at the end of the evening, he personally had sold 50 cases of it uh, and we'd sold a few extra. So we ended up taking nearly 100 cases of that first vintage and we never looked back. It's become an absolute favorite of mine. The only thing I would say about it is that you don't normally have, unless you also now are experienced with this wine, you don't have an idea of how and where to place it. So if you drink a really good Pilonie Maranchet Pucelle or a Masso Perrier or a Coton Chalamagne, you have in your idea what those wines maybe should taste like. And you say, yes, that's not only a good wine, but it's typical of where it comes from. When you taste the Clos Blanc for the first time, you don't have that in the background. You just have, well, you know, that seems quite good, but I don't quite know what to make of it. So I think some of you will be experienced with this wine and some a bit less so. Sylvie, let me pour Thank you some. You. It's, I think I'm right to saying it's not quite 100% Chardonnay, there's just a trace of other things. Yes, you have Pinot Blanc and uh, Pinot Gris, and uh, it's mm. uh, harvest every year in three times because it's not ripe at the same time. It's uh, quite uh, a big parcel, it's uh, three hectares. And uh, it's a very bad boy during the vinification and during the aging, because it tastes very differently during his, uh, his élevage. But at the end, uh, well, it's the last wine that we bottle in April. It's 18 months aging in uh, barrels. And after, at the end, you have a very complex wine, I would say. Another nice uh, story of the very early days when, um, this was the first white wine. And we'd always taste, when tasting the new young vintage, we'd always taste the reds and still do. We taste the reds first and then the whites. And so we'd finished our last red, which is Grand Cru Musigny. And we'd have our first white, the Clos Blanc. You'd pour the Clos Blanc into a glass that still had some dregs of Musigny. And you got this most sensational rosé, um, just as a, to rinse the glass out before you enjoyed the wine. So, I mean, I think it's quite clear there is a power to this wine which has you thinking, are we Premier Cru, are we Grand Cru? Um, because then, all around you have the very famous red wines and just in the middle you have the Clos Blanc because up the Clos Blanc you have the Musigny Vineyards. On the left side it's the Clos Vougeot, the Grand Cru, and on the right side it's uh, Chambol Musigny Les Amoureuses, Premier Cru. I'm getting a little bit of reduction on this wine, but that nice sort of lightly struck match gunflint reduction, not as exaggerated as one or two producers have become famous for doing. But it's just a little bit there to keep it fresh. And I think we don't, probably don't need to talk too much uh, to you about this vintage 2017, because I think it's already well established as being um, top news for white and making very approachable reds. I keep reassessing upwards my view of the red vintage because the wines are, uh, we knew they'd be ready early, but we didn't know they'd be quite as enjoyable as, as they are becoming. Jasper, what's the rule, what's the rule on blending in Pinot Blanc and Pinot Gris in Burgundy? Um, oddly enough, you're allowed them in the red wines, but you're not really supposed to have them in the white wines uh, above the generic level. Nobody minds if it's historical, if it's ancient, which is the case. What you wouldn't be allowed to do would be to start out with a vineyard and plant it up with Pinot Blanc or Pinot Gris uh, from scratch, unless it's uh, just a Bourgogne or Oak Code level, then you can. But I mean, here we're talking about 1% Pinot Blanc and 3 or 4% yes, Pinot uh, Gris. very few, and it's in the middle of the parcel now. Mm. Probably the whoever sold them the uh, the vine plants and ran out of what they meant to have and uh, <laughs> sent them whatever they got handy. There are plenty of stories of that. What about the oak regime here? Uh, the oak, it's no more than thirty percent of new oak, and uh, what is specially for all the um, the wine at the at the domain, it's uh, we have our own wood 
who came from Cito Forest, because every year we bought some uh, trees, we asked the, the, the coopers to cut it, and we dry it at the estate during three years, which just uh, returned the okay. Mera, it's called the Mera, the little pieces of wood. We just return it, and it's uh, natural dry with the sun and the snow and everything. And then we ask eight different coopers to make the barrels in medium toast for all the wines. Just to situate uh, Vougeot and Cito. So <laughs> Vougeot is named after a little river called the Vouge, which rises out of the hillside, uh, very almost next door to uh, this um, uh, vineyard. And it goes down into the plain. It's going to join the River Seine, but on the way, it goes through the forest of Cito, where these barrels were made from, and it goes past the, um, the famous abbey of Cito, where the Cistercian monks hang out. And one of the reasons why they planted uh, Vujo, and particularly the Clos Vujo, straight away, uh, was because having got established uh, in this forest, uh, they then sort of went back up river to see where they could find some land suitable for vineyards. And they got the Clovisho, which famously they then enclosed with its wall and kept until the French Revolution. Okay, um, maybe um, we should try um, the next wine and then the Chevalier Morichet and then get your opinions on the three whites together. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, I think, uh, have you got all three wines? Yeah, we do. Yeah, great, okay. Uh, so this is the only wine in Burgundy labeled as Charlemagne. It's not a mistake for Coton Charlemagne. And it's either my fault or my credit. Yes, it's not my idea, fortunately. <laughs> so originally, the domain had a plot of Coton Charlemagne, Le Charlemagne. So there are many vineyards that can call themselves Coton Charlemagne, but the two classics are Le Charlemagne and next door, En Charlemagne. Just those two letters before Charlemagne, Le or En, which changed the vineyards. Um, and so they called the wine Coton Charlemagne Le Charlemagne to give it its very specific plot. Later on, about 2013, I think, mm -hmm. they got a second plot, which was En Charlemagne. And they thought, what do we do here? We can't go on calling it Le Charlemagne if it actually comes from the two different vineyards. We don't want to make two separate wines. We want to blend them together, which would be a classic thing to do. And I had been uh, snooping back through the, the textbooks, if you like, and I had discovered that originally in 1936, a separate appellation had been um, enabled called just Charlemagne, without the word Courton. Uh, and it had fallen into disuse, but it still was officially on the statute books. So I said, well, this is perfect. Because your Courton Charlemagne just comes from Vineyard, we Charlemagne in the name, let's call it Charlemagne. Yes. So it's, That's what we did. <laughs> it's unique uh, in Burgundy, but uh, it is effectively a Courton Charlemagne. So enjoy that. We're going to have to check out our previous wine and try mm -hmm. the next. Charlemagne. This is a smaller um, production here. Yes, it's uh, 0 0.5 hectares. So it's not a lot. We produce per year around uh, 2,300 uh, 2, bottles, more, more or less. That depends. Mm -hmm. And all the vines here, these were planted in the 50s. Both, very both old plots. vines. Yeah. Oh, not very old. We're going to get older than that <laughs> before we finish. With the sham. Yes. Bouquet is a little bit more opulent in my glass. That's a bit less than that. A bit more opulent. <laughs> Very powerful, huh? Yeah. Mm. Long life. It's very demonstrative. Compared to Clos Blanc, it's more uh, more fine. You have the long life uh, very slowly, step by step. But the Charlemagne, it uh, really shows uh, really the, the long life. And also about one third new wood, or a bit more this one? A bit more. A bit more, yes. Around 40, yes, 40. Exactly 45. Which I think shows a little bit in the, in the, both in the bouquet and in the, the muscle of this wine. And our third wine. So when I um, first bought the wines here, there was the Clos Blanc, 
there was a little bit of village Pidouni actually. There was the Clé Blanc and there was the uh, Coton Chalamain. Uh, and then later on, has arrived at different times. Well, Chevalier Maraché, then Batar Maraché, and Bienvenue Batar Maraché. Maybe next week, Le Maraché. <laughs> <laughs> and various other, uh, other, the Pyrénées Premier Cru and the Chassin Maraché Premier Cru just arrived. The Chevalier is very, very small parcel. 0.15 of a hectare. Mm -hmm. Two very small. And one third new wood, so I am surmising that there were three barrels made. Exactly. In a good year. <laughs> Which 2017 was. 20, yes. Good year for the wives. Oh, yeah. It's, it's gone back to having a little bit of, the, in our bottle, gone back to having a little bit of the reductive note of the Clos Blanc but also the fruit wow. weight and the energy of the Charlemagne. Very delicate. Mm. Huh? I had my picnic lunch on Monday, just, just by Chevalier Maraschet, while I was out in uh, Pyrene, uh tasting lots of 2021s. I just started the, the new tasting campaign. Mm. Voila. Voila, voila. So what are the thoughts from the room on our three white lines? If you're ready. Impressive. Very, very good. Very solid, you know, um, great freshness, substantial mouthfeel, really kind of very nice round wines. Yes, yeah. it's a rare domain that I think gets reds and whites uh, equally correct, but I've been impressed all the way through with the whites since, since first meeting the 99 Clos Blanc. And Clos Blanc has become um, a fabulous uh, part, part of my drinking pattern, shall we say. Um, and as most of you know, I worked for a while at Berry Brothers, and one of the benefits of working there was that you could, with permission, but you could raid the Berry family cellar. Uh, and the only thing was that when you were talking about the wines to your guests, you had to remember which century they came from. So it uh, wasn't always the most recent century. Um, and on one occasion, uh, after the domain had been in place for 10, 11 years, we decided to put on a press tasting of the first 10 vintages of the Clos Blanc. So we had the 99 through to the 2009. 11 vintages um, and Sylvie came over to London for that and I managed to find in Simon Berry's sort of private cellar a bottle of 1919 uh, and we were doing this in 2019 so no we couldn't have been doing it 2009 we were doing it um, or 10 uh, so it was sort of a 90 year old bottle of wine uh, and it was lightly brown in colour but it freshened up once it had been opened and it was a really interesting enjoyable mm. drink um, and in fact, they had five bottles, and over my 10 years or so with Berry Brothers, I managed to drink three of them. But <laughs> <laughs> Never be ashamed to be greedy <laughs> when there's good wine at stake. So, um, yes, uh, I think in the end, when you have them side by side, you have to say that there is extra concentration in the two Grand Crus, but I still adore the balance and the, and the charm and the character of that Clos Blanc. And our um, geological friend, <laughs> Françoise Vanier, says that she has, she's, she's done little, she's about to do tests throughout Clos Vougeot, but she already has an idea of what Clos Vougeot offers. But she has also, she told me what the uh, um, vineyard uh, makeup is here, geologically, it's clearly suited to white wine in a way that the rest of the area is not. And much as you may enjoy the white mutiny from De Vogue, it's not because there's a little strain of geology in the middle of the mutiny vineyard that says this should be white. It's because Madame de Vogue said she wanted some white wine to drink at home. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the, the Spain are perfectly happy about that. But here, in the case of the Clos Blanc, it is genuinely a white wine terroir. So that's a good wine to fool your friends with in a blind wine tasting. Coton seems to be the most reductive in three years. It's the most reductive. Okay. That could be. I, yeah. 
In our bottle, it's the least attractive, but that's just a chance of bottle by bottle. So if you if you had to choose a favourite, Chevalier. Yeah. Chevalier. It really is quite good, that Chevalier. It's 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 ready now. Like I think the the Shalaman is going to get better, but the yeah. Chevalier is very like you know pleasantly drinking now. But it will go on in that uh, style for a long, long time. And other other people have uh, suggested this to me as well about Chevalier. Of all the Grand Crus of Maurice, it's the one that presents itself first, but that doesn't stop it lasting at least as long as the others. Um, and incidentally, between the Bata Maurice and the Bienvenue Bata, uh, the best of the two of those is whichever Amy's got most of to sell, but apart from that, um, uh, I think here at the domain, they're big, big fans of the Bienvenue Bata Maurice. To the extent that when I'm tasting the wines, they serve the Bata before the Bienvenue Bata, mm -hmm. which nobody else would. But I think it works here. Yeah? Okay, so you've got two more vintages, lucky people of Chevalier to have uh, with your dinner later on, which are, I think, 15 and 14, uh, I believe. I anyway, you, you know what you yes. have, even if uh, we're not sure. Are you ready to take a look at the reds, or do you want another minute or two savouring the whites? You can move on. Okay. So I feel sorry for the first red, because it's a little bit of a victim. Um, of the passage from one color to another. When you go from super powerful whites to a village red, uh, it's not gonna be easy for it to, to shine as much as the wine possibly deserves. So it's our sacrificial victim. Um, but it is also a key part of the domain because it is a monopole, a monopoly. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the vineyard. Uh, Vougeot Clos du Priori, it's down the village of Vougeot. It's situated just near the river La Vouge. So uh, it's quite more mineral. On the other hand, you have a, a little part of Chambol, the Chambol style. So it's very, very elegant wine with a touch of minerality. It's always uh, ripe uh, at the beginning. Yeah? We harvest it the first week when we start the harvest because it's uh, really ripe uh, very early. And uh, it's a very nice. It's not a wine that you can age uh, longer. But I think it's good to be drinking the 10 coming years. It does have one little uh, problem of its own, which no other vineyard has. Yes, the ducks come out of the river and eat the grapes. But, uh, <laughs> however, that just means that you eat the ducks. So, well. <laughs> and then they've, they're already sort of pre marinated with the, the grape juice. That's the single head of that problem. So, I'm going to pour that. Um, now, early on, the wines were always um, de-stemmed, but under Pierre Vincent, they began to use, they did two things. They reduced the amount of new oak and they increased the amount of stems, of whole cluster vinification. So not this wine, it doesn't have a huge amount, I don't suppose. No, uh, it's just, uh, tw well, 20%. It's made with the, the old vines because you have a two different plantations. So Pierre had, um, well, the style of wine that Pierre was trying to make was he didn't worry if it was light in color. He wants a real perfume in the bouquet and then an elegant wine, um, enough structure, but, but not massively extracted on the palate. That's very much Pierre's hallmark. Quite different from early Pascal Marchand. And also, we don't make um, a lot of uh, extraction, a lot of pigeage during the vinification. We just do remontage. Pumping over. Pump, yeah. Yes, pumping over. They also have probably the longest sorting table I've seen in any domain. <laughs> huge number of people from lots of different. Uh, um, nationalities working on it. So if any of you got young family members who want to do a harvest. 17 then, people we were. Yeah, then, uh, then there's often a place here at Fougere to do that. So 
this is a village wine in 2017, so I think that it's coming to be um, quite close to getting into its drinkability window. Our bottle has a little bit of reduction. Yes. Mm. Yours may not. But it's got some of those characters of wine made with the stems in that you get this sort of light raspberry with white pepper or crushed strawberry. Um, ours is a little firmer at the back because of that reductive element, but that's something that will blow off quickly enough. Good fresh acidity, which in fact, mm. in all these recent hot years, uh, has remained a feature of the wines and uh, something that people didn't expect, uh, but were very, very happy to have. So how many red wines have you been served? Uh, six. No, oh, you've got them all in front of you. No, they, 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 we don't have the bone. Oh, we don't have them all. We no. don't have the yeah. bone. They, they have the bone. So on your sheet, the next wine up is the Vaune Romanet Champerdry 2018? Yes. Yeah, okay, we don't have that because uh, you have the last bottles left in captivity. <laughs> uh, exactly. There are none at the domain. Uh, so we will just talk about it as if we did have it. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a small parcel. It's very well uh, situated because it's in uh, La Grande Rue. So it's a nice situation. Uh, the problem is the small parcel. And we have it since 2015. So it, we were converting the, the, the vineyards in uh, organic farming since 2015. And it's 100% uh, of all bunches for the vinification. It's uh, the smallest vats in the winery. <laughs> Very small. All of the fermenting vats here are in wood. And when they were purchased, because they were bought new rather than uh, taking over old ones, uh, they were all uh, instructed to be of sizes to suit particular vineyards. So there's one that always gets the Musigny, one that always gets the Bonne Romanée, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, it's a lovely vineyard, Champerdry, for a village vineyard, because as uh, Sylvie just said, it starts above Grand Rue, and the northern side of it uh, flows into uh, Premier Cru Aurigno. So um, uh, it's, uh, or do I mean Petit Mont? I mean mm. Petit Mont, I think. Um, so it's very well placed. 2018, so I imagine it's going to be a little bit on the firm side, a little bit on the young side. Uh, we've just done a big tasting of 18s, um, and the Vouchere wines uh, came out well from that tasting, um, but we didn't have that wine in it, so uh, I haven't tasted it recently. I imagine, however, it's got a, a more personality than the Vujo 17. Maybe more complex, more, um, I think. But you, it's also, it's high on the slope, so it's going to be much more a limestone style wine. So it could be a little bit more elegant, a little bit more daintiness, up from a more powerful vineyard, a vintage, of course. Yes. So the domain actually has very, very few Premier Cru vineyards. So after this, we're going to go just in, um, no, we've got one more uh, village wine and then uh, three Grand Cru's. Um, but if we take the wines, the red wines as pairs, if you've got two young village wines, then you've got two 2012s and then two young Grand Cru's. Any, anything you want to um, feed back about the Vougeot and the Verne Romanet? Maybe the aromas, tell us. I think the aromas, uh, it was really expressive when it was young. Well, I think that the Vujo is lovely. And um, I think you could drink this all afternoon very comfortably. I'm not sure it's going to change a great deal from here, but it's in a fantastic place for drinking. And that may be just where the, the wine is in the, in the sense that it's village. But also I think it's another example of 2017 being absolutely ready and approachable. It, it replicates the 2007s, which I remember you liked so much a few years ago. I did, yes, you are correct. I don't so, think the winemaking would have been very different, mm, but the vintage. Yes, the certainly. vintage, for sure. 
Like 17 is like a lot more rustic, like you know, drinking, and like you know, 18 is probably like you know, a little bit more fresh. The volume was a yes, no, that, that is a difference. You're right. You you have more bunches. You have 100 percent of uh, whole bunches in the in the volume. Yeah, so so in fact that is one real difference between the two. Yeah. Very yeah. different Okay. Um I'm just having a look. We have one we have at least one more wine, probably more than that, which is also hundred percent whole bunches. Do you have the two 2012s in front of you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well let's taste those. Now, it's a magnum of, I think yours may be magnums of both, but the Eversal is certainly a magnum because it was only made in magnums. And this is a, vine a part of the Eversal vineyard, which is very close to Mr. Boisset's heart because, as I said at the beginning, that's where he started. It's the um, extension of the hillside like Combo One and um, Champa. And this is the first vineyard which is not the Premier Cru, but many people think it perhaps could be. Um, it will be a Premier Cru. One day, you I'm put sure. in the dossier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. there, there is an attempt to uh, make it cremated, so it could happen. And uh, I'm very fond of this wine because the last vintage made of it was 2015, and I managed to persuade Sylvie to let us buy the entire crop. When Geoffrey les Evocelles en full, en full, it's a small part in Geoffrey Chambertin les Evocelles, and it's different because we have planted differently. You know, normally the normal plantation for a, for a parcel, it's 10,000. Uh, vines per hectare. And here in uh, Les Ebocelles, we have planted 36,000 vines per hectare. It means that you couldn't go uh, only, only by your uh, feet to, to take care about the vineyards and to make the treatment. Only uh, a man can go in the parcel to make the, the treatment. And all the, the vines are in competition because they are very close to each other. You have, for sure, less grape, very small grapes, and very concentrated. We call it mille rondage because it's very small, uh, small grapes, but a lot of concentration and uh, powerful. Uh, which I think you can see in the wine, because remember, this is just a village wine, um, a very good vineyard, and there is a level of concentration in that, which is very impressive. Um, and of course, it enables me to uh, introduce our next tasting event in 10 days time with Olivier Lamy, when we're looking at all his high density planting white uh, wines. But since Olivier and the Maine Le started doing this, the authorities changed the rules because they thought it was making, the wine was too good and they therefore had to uh, ban it. So they've now put in a rule that says no two plants can be closer together than half a meter. Are you with me on this? Uh, I mean, really, our, our magnum here is, I mean, Sylvia and I are going to polish it off between us. Uh, <laughs> one magnum for two, it's enough. If one's not drinking. <laughs> <laughs> and alongside that, you have the Grand Cru Cham Chambertin, and as you know, Champ Chambertin can be either the Champ Vineyard or the Masoyer Chambertin Vineyard. In this case, it all comes from Masoyer, but people are more used to seeing the name Cham. So I think right from the start, the domain made the decision that they were going to call it both. And so it's called Champ Chambertin Les Masoyer. Um, it's the oldest vines in the domain, planted in 1901 and 1902. So um, now getting on for 120 years old, still, still there, still planted. Um, and it is frequently one of my top favorites uh, out of the range. So we, <clears throat> no, sorry, always in a good health. Even in 2021, when we had the frost, uh, Cham Chambertin was a really uh, great vineyards, no damage, nothing. And uh, every year, the Champ Chambertin, all the grapes are always uh, great. 
and uh, we don't. The problem is that we don't know what was planted uh, long time ago. We have no records about this, but it's really always the the, the best vineyards. It's a funny thing about Sham. Those of you who were at our last event when we had three different growers, Sham, all of them had really ancient vines as well. Uh, Roti, Bachelet, and uh, Yuga. I think uh, I think Jasper, this is a step up for me. Yes, it should be. It's quite a big step up. I mean, it's yes. really, I don't know yes. what else. It's a lovely, silky quality. It's funny. It's, it's really good. Just beginning to drip. Well, I mean, part of what we're trying to do with this series is spread the word about how many first-class domains there are in Burgundy. It's not just the three or four or even six or eight that get most commonly quoted. But, um, I love ways like this. Yeah. Also. In 2012, it wasn't the easiest of vintages. It was a rather small crop. Um, do we know? So the Chevrolet really Champetard on Eversel, the crop was just 19 hectolitres a hectare. And in um, the Champ Champetard Masuriere, it was just 23 hectolitres a hectare. Um, the flowering weather wasn't very good. Um, there was hail in the Cote de Bone, but not up here. But it was a small crop for everybody. Uh, Jasper, just, just singing from the same hymn sheet as Richard, I find it, this is spectacular and always in this lineup, this is always so, there's always a generosity. There's a lovely, silky, polished notes to it, but there's just this generous nature to it. It's, it's yeah, fantastic. Great. Uh, and I mean, you know, this is, this, is, this is also part of Pierre Vincent's genius as well. Mm. I'm just gently sniffing, right? On the planet, you can enjoy it. Just beginning to develop one or two notes of maturity. I think they're both in a pretty good place for drinking now, actually. And we'll age further. Yep. Good acidity. Um, so actually, this champ champ don't age more than ten years. It's got a long time ahead, but I don't have a problem with um, country mouth needs it. So. So it's a little bit odd to be jumping around in vintages, but then we needed to finish with Musini 17 uh, before you have your vertical of Musini. Uh, I should want notes back about those later on. Um, see how they did. So after these two, we've got the Bonma and the Musini, two Grand Cruz or Chambol. Now, what's interesting is that one of the companies that Domaine de la Vougere or Mr. Boisset took over was called Pierre Ponnel. And as you may or may not know, Christophe Rumier's mother is a Ponnel. So very frequently, and it's in the case, I think, in both Musnier and Bama, the Rumier holdings and the Vougeret holdings are absolutely Never. next door <laughs> because it was a family, di family division within the Ponnel family at an earlier period. Even in Charlemagne. Only Charlemagne, too, Charlemagne. yes. So whenever, whenever Christophe's run out of wines, he comes around here and says, can he borrow a bottle or two? <laughs> Not true. I'm <laughs> enjoying my charm, charm time. Take your time, yes. Mm. Okay, so the Bon Mar holding always look, this looks as though it shouldn't be a very good wine because if you see where the Bon Mar is, it's in a flat part of the vineyard, um, dug out of what was once obviously a quarry. Uh, there's also a little bit that uh, goes uphill more classically next door. But part of it is there, and you look at it and think, I'd be surprised if that's going to be as good as the rest. And yet when he tasted the cellar, yeah. it, it works, it really <laughs> does. So back to 2017. Um, the other bit of good, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry, it's 100, the whole bunches. 
for the 2017, for the bond mark. And long aging, the same, and it's uh, around 17 months aging. What we did since five years, uh, it's uh, maybe for the banma, it's 16 months aging in barrels, and then uh, we pour it up in a tank in standstill for one month. And after we bottle. So exactly, it's one big parcel, as Jasper told you, and then we have two very small parcels up this little uh, carrier. Mm. It's got that gorgeous, these sumptuous uh, bouquet. Uh, this tastes like a very chambol uh, bon mar, even though, in fact, it's nearer to the moray end of the vineyard. But it, it's tasting like a... So, I mean, we're on the white soil here, basically, mm. aren't we? That would explain that. You remember that Bon Mar is sort of half white soil and half either red or brown soil. Um, but if you're lower on the slope, uh, you are more typically, um, no, you're more typically brown soil. Not that wrong. But this is tasting to me like a white soil. Fine. Maybe your quarry is different. Maybe because of the bees, because we have to. <laughs> They're beehives around the vineyard. It's part of their biodynamic. We didn't talk about what goes on in the vineyard, but everything is uh, organic, and energy, certified. biodynamic, and certified. And indeed, if you come and visit the winery, you can go out the back and you'll see where their own wood is being dried to turn into barrels. And you'll see where they have got a little kitchen garden where they're growing the herbs to use afterwards in the biodynamic sprays. Silence in the room as you taste the bon oh. Still got a little bit of youthful structure, astringency, astringency from the stems, but the fruit profile I think is beginning to advance, beginning to get where we want it to be. It's young. It's young, mm. but it's not too far away. Mm. Like people say young in like a negative connotation, but it's good, right? Mm. It's young, but it's entirely accessible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, hmm. I actually don't find the whole bunches show quite as much here, even though it's 100% whole bunch. Um, but I can see them present. Ah, yes. Extra, extra detail. Can you show that oh, no. no, you can. So we say 100% whole bunch, but nowadays, they pick up the uh, bunches and they cut out the big stems. So it's only got the little stems rather than everything. So um, what you might call decorticated. <laughs> when you do that, like what's the difference? When you do like, you know, cut that okay, out. Okay, well, if you actually look at the, you hold the bunch up, um, or if you see the stems after, if they've been de-stemmed, you can see that the main stem is often quite green, and it, it has um, too much in proportion to uh, the rest of the bunch. Um, there are two things that happen if you use the whole cluster. One is that you're keeping the individual berries completely intact, and they then start a little bit of an intracellular fermentation inside the berries. And the other is you have both a physical and a chemical effect from the stems. Now, it's that which some people find too much. They find it makes the wines quite herbaceous, a bit green tasting. And that has historically been the criticism of the whole cluster point of view. But if you can take out that big stem and leave all the little tiny connecting stems into the berries, then you're getting the best of both worlds. It's a huge amount of work. Yes, um, that's why we are a lot. But it, exactly, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it pays off. So I think it makes a lot of sense. A few other people have started doing it. Um, Vaucheray was one of the very first. Um, David Dubon tried it for a while. Uh, Jean-Pierre Guillon in Romanet now does it for everything. And he employs more people doing that than he does actually picking the grapes in the, uh, in the vineyards. Um, and uh, Pierre-Olivier Garcia, a young man of promise in Rue Saint-Georges, is doing it. 
and he admits that the place where he got the idea from was uh, the Musini of Ujrae. Voilà. Um, so, when, when you taste it, do you taste the difference? Uh, I think the only way you could definitely do that would be if you had a big cuvee and you did half of it normal and half of it decorticated. <laughs> Um, we, we have done that. So you have done that? Yeah, yeah. it was a lot. Oh, there you go. Oh, 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 oh. And oh. did you keep some bottles back? Yes. Ah, right. So yeah. we can try this next time we're all at Bougeret together. Uh, we'll try it. We'll ask for uh, Sylvie if she can show us the two versions of Chevrolet Ever in 2018 when they've got examples both ways. But if the name were very recently, they have changed from being a whole bunch without doing that to whole bunch stems removed um, is Domaine Guillon and I've definitely seen a big kick forward in equality. If you can do it then it's a wonderful thing to do but it is enormously hard work. Thibaut Ligier Belair tried it but he said I, you know, I had a small team of my friends who come from vintage it was early on in his career and so we thought we'd do it to cheer ourselves up we thought we'd have a glass of wine but before we were halfway through even the first video we were so drunk uh, <laughs> the morning, they just all fell over, and, uh, and so they had to give up doing it. <laughs> well, I guess okay. next time we do, we will do it. Let's try the mutiny alongside. Which one? What can we say about <laughs> Musini? <Muzini? laughs> no. oh. Old vines after two years old. <laughs> In our bottles, I'm getting less aromatics on the Musini than on the Bonnard. It's a bit lighter in colour, but we'll wait and see how it emerges. It's certainly tight compared to Bomar, isn't it? Where did the Bugini come from, actually? How did that come in The Bugini holding was uh, from Pierre Parnell, I think. So there's one bit that's next to Christophe Rubier, and there's one bit that's next to Fred Munier. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just beginning. And I mean, we've actually, we're using these Alto Universals rather than the Burgundy glass. And I can think it probably needs the burgundy glass really to start expressing itself. You have to go go looking for this wine a bit, but nonetheless, on the palate, the glass, I think, is sensational and the length of flavour. But it's it's much more backward than the wrong mark. Mm. Continue. <laughs> So I think that's gonna that's gonna blossom. We will take our time over ours. We've got to finish our magnum of ever sell first. After all. <laughs> How are they showing for you? Are, you? are they replicating what I'm saying? So I don't know which way around you're going to do it. You've got um, a biggish vertical of Musini, you lucky people, and then a couple of bottles of Chevalier uh, Morichet. To, which may be saving for cheese, or maybe you'll have those next. I don't know. That's up to you. Um, but um, it's a shame that we didn't go. <laughs> no, no, we can't be there. Fairly soon, fairly soon, we'll be coming to join you. So, do you have any questions either about what we've tasted, about the domain in general, or indeed about the wines to come? Jasper, I was just saying that I thought absolutely nailed it on the description of the Musini versus the Bon Mar. Yes. But actually, right now, the Bon Mar is, you know, so 
delicious to drink. I mean, you you know, if you were saying, well, what's the what, what's more drinkable tonight? I mean, it would be the Bon Mar, I think. I don't want everybody else to yeah, agree. Yeah. The yes. But the has yeah. a has, has just this, you know, concentration and kind of like you said, you have to look for it. I think it was such a good phrase. Um, it's just you know, a little bit more. You know, but it is there, and you see it in the finesse of the finish and the, the, yes. the sort of mineral tension almost of that wine. It just, it, um, judging from this, I'd say to people, if you want to drink the Bob Mana, go ahead. It'll be better if you keep it, but you can drink it now. But the Musini, absolutely don't touch it. It would be a big shame to drink this wine for another five years, I suspect. Good. So do you have any questions you want to ask about the wines we've had, the wines you're going to have, or while we've got Sylvie about the domain in general? Otherwise, we will leave you in peace to enjoy your dinner. Yeah. Well, yeah, always has a question. Nice yeah. yeah. It's easy, though. Like, anything that we should be aware of, like for the upcoming wines, or any, like, uh, note for us when we are enjoying the upcoming vintages, like the Musi and the Chevalier? Okay, so the Musini, uh, I don't have the list in front of me. Could you, someone just tell me roughly what they are? Remind me. 2010 to yeah, okay. We have 10, 11, oh, okay. 12, 13. Yeah. Uh, Sylvie has kindly passed me okay. the list. Um, so you've obviously got, uh, in 10 and 15, you've got uh, very classic years. 16, I think, is going to be a little bit backward. 14 and 13, you can definitely tell if somebody's done um, a good job because they were awkward years. The thing to avoid in 14 was panicking and a little bit of a rot thing going on in the Cote de and it was important not to pick too early. 13, it has a poor reputation in general and some wines are utterly stunning in 13. Uh, so it'll be really, really interesting to see if that one comes through. Uh, but there's a chance that that could be Completely brilliant. And 2011 is a vintage to please Chris Aarons. And so far as that it's, it's a nice vintage, which is just very easy drinking and uh, should give pleasure. Um, yeah, and then you've got two wonderful use. white burgundy yeah, vintages yeah, in the 15 and the 14 Chevalier. I'm so right. I think, um, yeah, all the musenies you're going to taste, uh, all the wines you're going to taste over dinner are made by Pierre Vincent. So there will be a continuity of style throughout. Yes, what can I say? I, I would like to yeah. taste the 2012. Because, uh, and yeah. the, the really good vintage in the 16. So yes. I like it very much. 15, it was uh, great for, for all the wines. So. Yeah, should be good. <laughs> should but, be the, good. but the 12 will be particularly interesting because yes. we've already had the Eversal and the Champ Champ as mm. we are in 12. Okay. So you've got things to deliver okay. directly to compare with. Okay. Great. So, Jasmine, I, I do have two questions. The first is, so you say you work with eight coopers. Are, are there any like difference between them, and like, you know, which one do you prefer? For the different coopers, you mean? Yes. If there is a different, yeah. Do you have a preference? A preference for, for, for sure. A preference for the whites. You know, Chassin and Dany. It's better for the whites. <laughs> Uh, I would say for the, the reds, the Grand Cru reds, it's better Francois Frère because it's medium toast huh? and it's really good for the, for the Grand Cru. Uh, we have a little bit of Rousseau, but Rousseau it's better for the village, the, the reds village. Uh, we had it in the past uh, Mercure, Mercure is just to, to, to test what they did and uh, Tonnerie de Mercure, it was great also for the village. And we have Gauthier. Gauthier, it's uh, one of my favorites for the Premier Cru and Grand Cru. Gauthier is not from the region, is it? Yes, no, it's not They're from the region. They're from the Loire. Mm. Some mm. I think. Mm. Okay, that was first question. Second is the one that we always ask, and it's, ah. it's a little bit difficult because you have Musni. It's, um, <laughs> if there's a vineyard that you guys, you, you do not have, which one would it be that you want to add? Which one? 
which which vineyard that you don't know. And it's usually yeah. Rosemary, but you guys have that already. And you're not allowed to say Rosemary Conti. No, 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 no. <laughs> the reds are white. It could be either. You either one, one, yeah. Or both. Huh. White, uh, maybe Morache. Morache for the Grand Cru. Just and I, Yes, and maybe I would like to have some Meursault, Meursault Premier Cru. Mm -hmm. Rien. So which one? <laughs> which, 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 which Premier Cru? And, uh, Curry. Curry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and maybe for the Reds, uh, well, if I don't talk about uh, Romani Conti, Tash, and uh, maybe <laughs> the Reds, Louis Saint Georges La Richemont, I think, is a wonderful vineyard too. Okay, well, look, sounds like everybody's had a good evening. We've had fun at our end too, uh, and uh, you know, as we've got some more wine to, uh, to keep looking at. So have you over the dinner. So thank you all, and we'll see you in ten days' time with Olivier Lamy. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.